Voy a presentar a nuestro primer orador, Mr. Reza Shafi, gerente de producto, eh, vicepresidente de producto de OpenShift en la corporación Red Hat. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here in Buenos Aires. I love the city. I uh, used to come here almost every quarter. Um, when I was at MuleSoft for four years. And speaking of that, is there any ex muleys or current muleys in the room? Anyone? No, no one. Okay. <laughs> um, so today I wanted to, you know, obviously talk about the OpenShift roadmap and OpenShift vision. But before doing that, I wanted to maybe talk about a more fundamental question, which is, you know, why does it matter? Why does OpenShift matter in what we all do every day, what we all love to do every day? And to, to talk about that question, um, I'm going to go way back. I'm going to go to 2003, where in the Harvard Business Review, there was an article that came out that said, it doesn't matter. And by it doesn't matter, you know, obviously it's a play on word where it says IT doesn't matter. And uh, any of you remember this article, by any chance? It caused a pretty great deal, some people are nodding their head, uh, a fairly great deal of consternation in the IT sector, in the tech sector back then. Um, I remember I was a young consultant at the time, and uh, you know, I started wondering, like, if Nicholas Carr is right, then my future in IT might not be as bright as I expected it to be. And the, the case that Nicholas Carr was making was that IT is meant to be uh, what is called uh, commodity technology. So over time, Nicholas Carr was suggesting to companies to stop investing in IT because it's just like electricity and like railroads, it's meant to become a commodity technology that's best shared naturally and provided by a couple of providers, and that innovation is not going to happen by investing in IT by individual companies. And, and if you read the article, it actually is, you know, sounds fairly convincing. Now, fast forward 15 years later, and I look at the past week, And I have to say, I think Nicholas Carr was wrong. Um, I used Uber, um, the car sharing service, which has completely disrupted the taxi industry and the transportation industry in some ways, completely IT-based and completely innovative. Um, I used Concur, to, which by the way runs on OpenShift, um, to actually do all my expenses Um, completely changed the way one does expenses compared to 2003 um, using cell phones. When I was in the airplane, I used my cell phone to browse a set of 500 movies and decide which ones I wanted to watch. Again, completely changed the way that airlines are innovating at that level. Um, and then, by the way, the whole time I was using the cloud, deploying applications to various computing services on demand um, and getting access to... Uh, CPU and memory and so on, just like it was software. Um, so, so Nicholas Carr was probably wrong, but wait a minute. That last example I used, maybe he's actually right, because the way that I received all of the computing resources when I used AWS, um, That has somewhat commoditized computing services. I can go to a couple of cloud providers. I can use their services on a consumption-based basis. And so therefore, wouldn't that say that computing has become commoditized? So what's going on here? Um, has it been commoditized or has it not been commoditized? I would suggest that the answer is it depends, and that there's many layers to the equation. There's at least three. If you think about computing infrastructure from a pure compute atomics, from a pure perspective of, I just want CPU, I just want memory, I just want networking, 
that is on its way to commoditizing over time. And the cloud providers are definitely on their way to doing that. And that's great. But that doesn't mean that innovation is stopping on the layers above and that, that IT as a whole and technology as a whole is not a source of innovation. Because if you go just one layer above, what we commonly call middleware, innovation is still staggering. Um, you get things like Kafka, you get things like Vitesse. There is huge amounts of innovation that one can achieve by using new middleware services that are just appearing on the technological scene in order to write applications, which is the next layer above that. And applications, of course, are the things that give us the most innovations. By being able to more quickly build the right applications and improve the right applications, our businesses are going to be more successful. And that source of IT innovation is likely not going to stop for a long, long time. Uber is an application at the end of the story, and who cares what it's running on in the bottom layer, but the fact that it's using a really high-speed, high-scale queuing service or publish subscribe service does matter to Uber. But the fact what kind of hardware it's using probably doesn't matter that much. It's interesting because I think Nicholas Carr, and I'm not picking on Nicholas Carr too much here, but uh, was actually wrong on the electrical aspect of this as well. Um, in some ways, electricity as well is the same thing. Um, how electricity is generated and the electrical infrastructure doesn't matter that much. But if you go to the services that are built on top of it, there is still innovation there today. Um, you know, I was just at a Starbucks uh, in the States where I was able to put my iPhone down on the table and it started charging. That is innovation at the electrical services layer. The new cars that are electrical and you can just plug them in and they start charging, that's innovation at the electrical services layer. And of course, on the electrical devices, that innovation is not going to go away for a while. There is an important difference between electricity and technology, and, and, and really computing, I should say. Um, that is worrying me about where we're going. And to, to demonstrate what that difference is, I'm gonna go way back to when electricity was introduced as a commodity. These are devices back in the 1900s that started using electricity. And you'll notice something peculiar about them. So you've got a toaster on the left hand. You've got at the top left um, uh, a device to heat food. And bottom left, it's a, it's a hair straightener. And so you can see that all of them use a light bulb socket. And that's because electricity was first introduced for lighting. And then people started actually building other devices to actually tap into the electricity. And they said, okay, I'm just gonna use the, the light bulb as the interface. Now, that ended up to be a blessing in disguise because it provided right away a decoupling from the infrastructure. Instead of people creating devices that tapped right into Edison or Tesla's proprietary infrastructure in order to receive electricity, they just used the light bulb. And that decoupled the devices from the infrastructure. I'm worried that in today's world of computing, as the computing infrastructure is getting commoditized, the cloud providers who are basically the commodity provider are also trying to create services that are tightly coupling our applications, which are the equivalent of electrical devices, into their infrastructure. When you use a service like Lambda, when you use a service like Athena or Kinesis, you are tightly coupled to AWS's infrastructure. And what that means is, is if the equivalent of the toaster was built that way, I was told last night that here in Buenos Aires, there's two electricity provider, uh, Edisur and Edenor. Um, 
That would mean that whenever you move to a place that's at a sewer and your toaster was built with Edenor, you could not move your toaster. You got to buy a new toaster. You want to go to Uruguay? Sorry, you got to buy a new toaster. Um, and, or, that would not be a world I would like. Um, and you definitely don't want your applications to be that way. So, so that is a big part of why I think OpenShift matters, because OpenShift brings that neutrality layer, that portability layer, to the underlying cloud infrastructures. It allows you to take the advantage of the flexibility and ease of what infrastructure as a service has effectively become, yet be able to build applications that are decoupled from that while taking advantage of the flexibility and simplicity. I want to talk about how OpenShift achieves that. There is at least three pieces to the puzzle. The first is Kubernetes. The second is automated operations. And the third is bringing automated operations to the diverse set of services that are out there and not just one cloud provider services. And so let's talk about each of these. Let's start with Kubernetes. Kubernetes was introduced a while ago, 2015, I believe. Um, it's the uh, anniversary of Kubernetes. I saw a couple of uh, weeks ago. So you see a lot of blogs out there. And you see, Google obviously introduced Kubernetes. It was based on an internal project called Borg that Google itself used to actually consume services and, and, and um, run all of their applications. And Red Hat worked very closely with Google in order to bring Kubernetes to the enterprise and to make it usable by non-Google consumers. Um, there was two companies that worked closely with Google to do that, Red Hat and CoreOS. And they happen to be the same company now. Now, for a while there, if you were following this scene, it was unclear what orchestration technology. So everyone agreed that containers are the future. But it was unclear what orchestration technology is going to win. Um, there was a couple of competing orchestration technologies out there, Docker Swarm, Mesos, and Kubernetes being the top ones. But I think at this point, it is pretty clear that Kubernetes is the de facto orchestration standard. Because all the other vendors who were trying to push competing technology, including Mesos and Docker, have jumped on the Kubernetes side of the house. And that is great, because at least now, we don't have to argue about what is the right orchestration technology. And by the way, just to pause for a second and talk about what Kubernetes does and what orchestration is. At the end of the story, what it does is that it abstracts away the compute infrastructure from the overlying applications that are running on it. So you can say, I've got, I'm just going to keep adding compute on one side to serve my compute needs. But at the top, you just add applications and you tell Kubernetes what the compute needs are. And then it starts playing that perfect Tetris game in order to make sure that the right applications have the right resources. So you don't have to schedule all of that technology, all of that information. So Kubernetes acts as that great neutralization layer. And I would like to point out that Red Hat, with our experience in OpenShift and being the first ones to endorse it, really, um, we, you know, we, we have a great deal of expertise that we bring to the table. Um, and we've been contributing greatly to Kubernetes. So Red Hat heads you know, a dozen or so special interest group along with Google. Um, and um, we also have the most neutral view on how it should be tied to, to compute. Because we don't actually come in with, a, with an agenda that it should be tied tightly to the underlying compute infrastructure as opposed to some of the cloud providers. Um, so that's one piece of the puzzle. Let's talk about the other two pieces of the puzzle, which was automated operations and bringing the simplicity of the cloud to the services that are above the Kubernetes layer. Those two pieces of the puzzle, a big 
part of how Red Hat is solving that problem is through the acquisition of CoreOS and the integration of CoreOS technology into OpenShift and the future of OpenShift. So the, the capabilities I'm going to talk about next are going to be the building blocks that we acquired from CoreOS and how we're integrating that into OpenShift going forward. So CoreOS had three main products. Uh, one was called Con CoreOS Container Linux, which is um, container-optimized operating system with over-the-air updates. I'm going to talk more about that. CoreOS Tectonic, which was the competitor to OpenShift, Kubernetes distribution. It also came with automated operations and over-the-air updates. What I mean by that, by the way, is that it brings the simplicity of the cloud no matter where you're running it. So if you run Tectonic on AWS or on your premises on OpenStack or on Google, it doesn't matter. You will continue to get updates that will pop up just like your iPhone and say an update from version 1.7 to 1.8 of Kubernetes is available. Do you want to apply that? You press a button and within 10 minutes all of your nodes are updated. The cluster automatically backs itself up. The etcd state is backed up so that if something goes wrong, you can always restore it automatically. These are the capabilities we typically associate with the cloud, but we want to really have anywhere, and we just want to not worry about it. And that's what Tectonic brought to the picture. And finally, uh, CoreOS Quay, which was the um, re image registry that uh, allowed, a, allowed one to actually store all of the images and track their changes and point all the applications container to that. So I talked about that, right? So the big part of what CoreOS brought to the, to the picture is day two operations, automation of day two operations, installation, upgrade, backup, failure recovery, and so on, so that you don't have to worry about it no matter where you are. But that it brought that to the picture at the operating system and Kubernetes layer. But a good question that you might ask is what about everything else I use on top of it? I have Postgres database, MySQL database, I have Kafka running on there, um, I have Elasticsearch running on there, um, Redis, in-memory data grid, Fuse, whatnot. They all need to act like the simplicity of the cloud for me to be incented to use those services versus the cloud provider services that have the, the issue with the light bulb going all the way down to the provider. And so with that, we introduced at KubeCon Copenhagen about three months ago, something called the Operator Framework. It's an open source project. If you Google it, you'll, you'll see the GitHub organization. And the Operator Framework is all about bringing the toolkits from the CoreOS technology to all the service providers and to our customers so that they can use it to build cloud-like capabilities into their services so that all of the services I just mentioned behave like the cloud on top of Kubernetes. And as soon as we introduced the operator framework, we received a great deal of support with 60 plus ISVs at the onset coming in and saying they wanted to use the operator framework and certify on top of OpenShift. And if you go to the Operator Framework's awesome Operator repo, you'll see a list of 55 existing operators that have already been written that have that. There's things like Redis in there. There is a WebLogic one. There is a, um, um, Kafka one. There is many, many types of operators by a variety of vendors. Some of them are competitors to us. But that's exactly what we wanted. Our goal is to create a diverse set of services by all the vendors out there so that one cloud provider cannot hold us hostage to their services alone, and that is succeeding. So that's great. What does this mean for OpenShift? So we're taking all that technology and bringing it into OpenShift and exposing it as first-class citizen. So going forward, OpenShift is going to have an operator console as well. 
So not only there will be a console for the consumers of the cluster that want to deploy their applications, you'll have a console that gives you a much more system admin centric view of the cluster that will show you updates that are coming up so you can apply the updates. That'll give you monitoring and metering information, which I'll talk more about as well in the coming slides. I want to just go back now to the operating system. Um, I mentioned that Container Linux was one of the technologies that we acquired from CoreOS. Atomic and Container Linux are being merged into a new operating system that's called Red Hat CoreOS. And the Red Hat CoreOS operating system will have all the qualities of the Container Linux operating system. So it, will, it is going to be container optimized, meaning just enough operating system with a small surface area for attacks. <clears throat> it will also have over the air updates. That means that you are going to be able to receive updates that can be dynamically applied to all of your operating system layers running. With Container Linux, we have today over 200,000 nodes that are registered to receive automated updates. That means every two weeks when we push an update, 200,000 nodes get updated automatically. Um, and this is what's coming up to Red Hat CoreOS. That is going to be the nucleus of the new stack for OpenShift 4.0, which is the next version of OpenShift that will have the technologies I will talk about. So that means that the installation and upgrade experience of OpenShift is going to change fundamentally. Um, we are going to a world now where the first layer will be Red Hat CoreOS, and on top of that, Kubernetes with fully automated operations. So we go to, from this world where you have to do a lot more management of the infrastructure to a world where the whole infrastructure is automated operations with automated backups and automated tuning and automated upgrades and so on. But as an operator, you still want to see what's going on. So you're still going to be able to see, OK, these upgrades are coming in. I want to do a dry run. Let's see what's going to happen. OK, the dry run is looking good. First, I'm going to apply it to my pre-production environment. That worked. Now I'm going to apply it to my production environment. That worked. If it didn't work, you can roll it back. These are the things you want to be able to do as an operator. You want the system to automate it, but you still want to have control. Part of having control is going to be monitoring. And we are bringing in Prometheus. We're one of the um, main contributors to Prometheus, which is becoming a really important project for monitoring purposes out there. So we're building in Prometheus into OpenShift with out-of-the-box dashboards, both embedded within the operator console, but also with a technology called Grafana that allows you to view and slash and dash the data in, uh, in very um, powerful ways uh, baked into our console. Now, another feature that's going to be exposed is going to be called, is called operator metering. Um, and what this allows you to do is to see who is using what percentage of the cluster. As you go to OpenShift, you will notice that you know, one, one experience, and I'm sure those of you who are using it that way, it's an aggregating technology. All the different stakeholders that had different applications running on their own infrastructure are now going to be deploying their applications on Kubernetes, which is abstracting away the infrastructure layer. So guess who's paying the bill for the infrastructure now? It's not going to be the application owners anymore. It's going to be the Kubernetes provider. And if you are the, the people who are bringing in Kubernetes, you have to worry about paying the bill for the infrastructure. The application owners don't anymore. That's good, but you're going to have to explain to your CIO why this bill is so big. And so operator metering allows you to explain that. Sometimes we call this you know, metering and chargeback. Sometimes we call it metering and shame back. And that's because what it allows you to do is to show the, the division. This application is using this much of the AWS bill. This other application is using this much of the CPU and this much of the memory, and it comes down to this much dollars. Um, an important part of running op OpenShift at scale. Now I want to talk a little bit about the registry. So, 
the, who here has heard about a technology called Helm Charts? Or Helm? Okay, a couple of hands. So Helm is a technology used to describe application in the Kubernetes world. And we are betting quite a bit on Helm. So going forward, we, we are going to double down on Quay, the image registry support for Helm. And what that's going to be allowing us to do is to basically treat your own applications. If you have mobile apps that need to run on Kubernetes, if you have any enterprise apps, Spring app, whatnot, you represent them by Helm charts that describes what, the, you know, what Kubernetes constructs they, they need to map to. And then in Quay, we'll be able to represent those as applications, even though they span multiple image and multiple Kubernetes manifests, and then be able to tie that to a Helm operator, which comes out of the box with OpenShift, and which allows us to actually then have the full CI CD pipeline automated for you. So as a user, you just submit your code to GitHub, it builds in your favorite CI pipeline, it doesn't matter which one, but as soon as it's done, it's put in Quay's Helm repository, and you have the cluster listening to that Helm repository and automatically getting the updates there. Okay, that brings me to my second to last slide. We're going to exciting places with OpenShift 4, which is gonna be our next big release. I know OpenShift 3.10 was just released, 3.11 is coming up and it's going to have elements of what you just saw, such as metering and chargeback and monitoring built in, but it won't have the automated operations capabilities. With, automated, with uh, OpenShift 4, we're going to have the automated operation capabilities, the monitoring capabilities we just talked about. We are going to have these, um, an extended catalog of applications that are vendor-backed, that have automated operations with them, certified on OpenShift. And we're going to have the developer experience capability just talked about in terms of integration with Helm charts. So this is the big release for us, very exciting release um, that is coming up, currently planned for January type timeframe. Um, but we really believe this is a game changer. And the reason why this matters, the reason why this matters is because OpenShift is picking up steam. OpenShift is being used by more and more of our customers. And I believe that the reason, one of the big reasons why OpenShift is so popular is that we are able to abstract away the infrastructure, yet give you all the benefits of the clouds and of containerization without having you to have applications that tie you all the way to the cloud providers. And I think that's important. So, Work with us and uh, talk to us about OpenShift and OpenShift 4, and I look forward to talking to you in person as well. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Muy bien. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Reza. Eh, recuerdo la dinámica de este evento es totalmente colaborativa, entonces en el Coffee Break eh, está totalmente disponible Reza y cualquiera de los presentadores para acercarse y contestar cualquier pregunta que tengan ganas de hacer. Si requieren algún tipo de asistencia, estamos ahí para acompañarlos.